Yeah. 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 Ye
surface today is worried about the
That's his, okay. Don't want to cross jurisdictional lines here. All right, you might. I, was, I probably should go get coffee before you do this. Oh, can I do that? I can bring coffee to you. I'm pretty sure they can do that. Are you sure? Yeah, I'll make sure that happens. Yeah, yeah, I got, I've got to have that caffeine. Get me all wired and I say things I'm not supposed to. That's, That's what we want. Yeah. <laughs> It, that is. That was excitement. I've been awake all night thinking of the yeah. joy <laughs> of the yes, please. Thank you. So as you prepare for, <coughs> oh, this is not on, well, this is not our formal beginning, but I'm just wondering, as you prepare for a life and broadcast yeah. full time, do you wake up thinking, what would I do on a program this morning? Or does that not hit you yet? No, I, I wake up saying things like, try Campbell's soup. Mm, yeah. mm, good. <laughs> I don't know. It's the oddest thing. I, yeah. <laughs> You know, the good news is there'll be no shortage of topics. Yeah, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. There you are. You can just okay. put that in front of you. Okay. All right, if you don't mind. Nope. You know routine. I do. breakfast to begin at the St. Regis Hotel, so uh, we'll, we'll get started and uh, All right. okay. Thank you. let them join us in progress, as they say, but I'll wait until I get a signal that it's okay to go. It's okay to go. Good morning. Thanks for coming. I'm Dave Cook from The Monitor. Our guest today is Representative Mike Rogers, Chairman of the House Select Committee on Intelligence. This is his first visit with our group, and we appreciate his starting his morning this way. He grew up in Michigan, graduated from Adrian College there. After serving in the Army, our guest became an FBI special agent specializing in public corruption cases in Chicago. He returned to Michigan in 94 and was elected to the state Senate the next year, rising to become majority floor leader. In 2000, he won by a resounding 111 votes, a hotly contested race for the House seat being vacated by Debbie Stabenow and has been re-elected handily uh, to six additional terms. He became chair of the House Intelligence Committee in 2010. This March, he, he announced he would be leaving Congress at the end of the current term to host a radio program for Cumulus Media. So much for biography, now on to the ever popular process portion of the program. As always, we're on the record here. Please no live blogging or tweeting, in short, no filing of any kind 
while the breakfast is underway to give us a chance to actually listen to our guest. There's no embargo when the session ends. As regular attendees know, if you'd like to ask a question, please do the traditional thing and send me a subtle, non-threatening signal. Raised eyebrow, finger wave, careful there, whatever have you. I'll happily call in one and all. We'll start off by offering our guests the opportunity to make some opening comments. Then we'll move to questions from around the table. Thanks again, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate uh, the invite. Thank you uh, for lowering your standards and letting yeah. a member, House <laughs> member in. We appreciate that very much. Um, I just thought I'd just real quickly uh, go around the world uh, as briefly just to let you know the challenges that I think face not only the U.S. intelligence services, uh, but our defense and, and what that, those of us who all are often crying about our uh, security matrix, the threat matrix being so varied and so deep and so wide that makes us, uh, uh, all of us not sleep at night. As a matter of fact, look at me, I'm only 25 years old. Look at this job has done to me. <laughs> um, one of the things, uh, if you look at both strategic and, and immediate threats, so in the strategic side, you have, still have a North Korea that's pursuing nuclear weapons very clearly. It's doing that. Uh, it's working to perfect its uh, missile systems in a way that is very, very concerning. If you recall, it was about a year ago when they uh, stood up a missile and, and uh, were bragging about the, the, the thought that they had the capability of hitting the western United States. Pretty serious, uh, uh, I think, threat to the United States that got washed over by all the other threats that we face. China has been very, very aggressive in militarization of space. Uh, and they are very aggressive about f uh, investment in technology, um, certainly to try to mute the strength of our U.S. naval forces around the world. And then once those things happen, you watch what's ha what their aggressiveness in the South China Sea. Uh, and that is clearly something that is concerning, and it's, I think it's a growing tension. Uh, I still believe that between Vietnam and uh, Japan, there will be some maritime skirmish within the next 24 months uh, and I don't think it'll be huge but I do think that there will be a maritime skirmish between uh, either Vietnam or Japan with China in their pursuit to push out uh, their boundaries in the South China Sea and that's significant about 40 percent of the world's trade goes through the South China Sea we've been as a US Navy been there uh, since we've been a country uh, and so when China starts telling us that the US Navy can't be in the South China Sea that's a huge and significant uh, strategic threat to the United States and certainly our economic uh, prowess in the world. Uh, clearly Russia is, uh, you can just turn on the TV and see where they're at. They've spent the last 10 years in that rise of oil money, uh, investing in their military, modernizing their military, uh, professionalizing their special forces. Uh, that has, uh, as you can see, has proved to be a valuable investment for them when it comes to Ukraine. So the, the fact that they were able to glide through the, and annex Crimea uh, and their activities in eastern uh, Ukraine are certainly troubling uh, and it shows you that the, the payoff of their investment and they know it and they understand it. Uh, they continue to uh, invest in their uh, Navy modernization. They've dropped some submarines in the water that are very, very sophisticated, very high tech. Uh, we hadn't seen that since the early 90s. So they're making an investment in their ability to project power around the world. Uh, when you look at where we are on Al-Qaeda, uh, this, is, this is the one that worries me most. This is the one, and the most immediate threat uh, is this proliferation of Al-Qaeda affiliates with capabilities and intentions uh, to strike outside of their areas of operation. So clearly, when you look at what's happening in Iraq, uh, and it started in Syria, by the way, and we need to be clear about that, we watched this development of Al-Qaeda in eastern Syria for three years. Uh, we watched them pool up in ways that we've never seen before. We watched them recruit in ways we've never seen before. And, and when I say recruit in ways we've never seen before, I mean successfully. In other words, they were gaining strength really by the day, by the month, and the longer it went, where there was no disruption, the more aggressive they became. And uh, about a year, year and a half ago, you saw the tension start between uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant uh, and uh, al-Nusra Front. And many argued it was because they thought they were so brutal uh, that they couldn't be part of al-Qaeda. It's pretty hard to argue that an organization that has, has participated in beheadings and stoning of women and flying airplanes into buildings would find anyone more brutal than themselves. 
Uh, it was really about control. Zawahiri was trying to exert some control uh, over uh, the ISIL uh, leadership. It was just having a difficult time doing it. They believed that if you're going to if you're going to be in this fight, uh, you want to hold land toward a caliphate. Uh, and the fight at that time, the disagreement was Zawahiri telling them, "We want you, ISIL, to focus in Iraq, not in Syria, and don't do external operations." The concerning part of that conversation was that the reason ISL, uh, ISIL wanted to do external operations is because they had such a large number of foreigners with Western passports uh, working with them. They saw that as a huge opportunity to conduct very easily and quickly operations in Europe, in the United States. Uh, Zawahiri thought it was too soon, and he wanted them to focus in Iraq. So now what you see is they apparently decided to focus in Iraq. So that split where they decertified Al-Qaeda, uh, I would look at it as two organized crime families in Chicago, right? At the end of the day, their goals and intentions are exactly the same. If they can work together, they're going to work together. If they're going to fight about it, they'll fight about it. But at the end of the day, they're brutal uh, criminal organizations, in this case, terrorist organizations. Uh, they're functioning the same way. All right, all right. Uh, so El Nusra now is reaching out. I think there's been some public reports about them reaching out uh, to AQAP uh, in Yemen. Yemen is looking for the Yemenese leadership, is looking for the AQAP leadership, excuse me, not the Yemenese government leadership, is looking for ways to try to have a success in an external operation. They believe that's important. If you remember, they were the first ones to hold territory in the south of Yemen. Uh, that they believed was the, the initiation of their ability to, hold, uh, to create and hold a caliphate. So you have all of these new relationships uh, happening in a way that's really concerning. El Shabaab, as you know, about two years ago, we uh, were able to establish the relationship between El Shabaab and AQAP. They were trying to get their branch down in uh, northern Africa. Uh, and you see the activity all across northern Africa. I won't go into all those details, take too long. But now you can see, and I hope you get a better picture, that this Al-Qaeda threat is getting worse by the day, not better by the day. And the fact that they hold a billion dollars in cash and gold bullion, um, and if you think about 9-11 took about $200,000 in, in maybe a year and a half of planning, uh, that's a lot of dangerous uh, cash laying in the kitty. These folks aren't worried about building schools and roads and uh, taking care of uh, public services. They're worried about killing uh, and trying to dominate individuals across Iraq, Syria. They'd love to take Lebanon. Now they're on the border of Jordan. They're on the border of Israel. I mean, this is as bad a situation as you can possibly imagine. And with that, I think we all should have a drink before we... Uh... Yeah, have a stiff orange juice, sir, it's a, in, the, in the monitor tradition. Um, let me ask you one or two, then we'll move to my, my colleagues. Let me start you with something closer to home. Yeah. Uh, you're a member of the House Republican uh, leadership team. What lesson or message, if any, do you take from uh, the triumph of Thad Cochran and the, and the loss of Tancredo? Does it say anything to you about where things are going in the Republican Party, or is it just all politics or local and there's no message? Yeah. Hannah survived. Yeah, Hannah survived. Um, listen, I th you, despite what you might uh, see portrayed, the Republican Party is a big tent party. And, and parties are coalitions. If you go travel overseas and you see parliaments, those are made up of these wildly different coalitions of cobbling uh, certain groups and philosophies together to, to form a, a governing uh, body. Well, here in America, we do it with two parties, and in those two parties are just a tremendous amount of coalitions. That's the way uh, our parties have really operated for a long time. So what you're seeing now is a filtering out and a struggle and a healthy debate about which of those coalitions gets more seats uh, in the Republican Party than the other coalitions. And I thought it was, a, you know, at the end of the day, I think Americans are ready for some governance. This last five years has been so devastating to the middle class. It's been devastating to energy prices. It's been devastating to our national security. It's been devastating to their own health care. They're looking for some leadership. And sometimes that means people forming a coalition, that means you're going to get something done. And I think the election showed across the country that people are ready for that. They're ready for a change in the way the country is being governed. And I think that's what you saw happen last night and, and over the last few months. Let me ask you one other, and that's obviously sure. about intelligence. Um, your counterpart in the, in the Senate, Senator Feinstein, has been critical about 
the level of um, detail and quality of briefing uh, that has been provided by the administration. Uh, yesterday on a conference call, uh, a, a, a defense, an intelligence official said that the American intelligence agencies had provided, quote, strategic warning that ISIS was growing. Um, is it your sense that you've been well served in terms of the ISIS intelligence you've been getting? You know, about two years ago, um, I was, I and others were ramping up this notion we had to do something in eastern Syria. Um, I did an op-ed on it. I talked about it. Well, I came to those conclusions based on the intelligence that was afforded to the, uh, the, the committee as a consumer of intelligence, right? So we get it all. Sometimes it's raw. It doesn't draw the conclusion that, you know, ISIS on this day is going to do this. We get all the raw intelligence so we can come to those conclusions ourselves. It was very clear to me uh, that years ago, uh, ISIL or ISIS was pooling up in a dangerous way, building training camps, recruiting, drawing in uh, uh, jihadists from around the world. We saw all of that happening. Uh, then we get to remember, we talked for a long time, nothing happened to disrupt that. Uh, then we saw them cross the border and go into to Fallujah. Nothing happened. That was six or eight months ago. So some notion that we didn't, we, we wouldn't know, have seen this coming means that you weren't paying attention um, uh, to the intelligence that was afforded us. Now, you know, c could they have come up and said, hey, this is the, let me, let me give you the Fluja update? I, maybe, maybe not. But nothing happened when they crossed the border. Nothing happened when they took Fallujah. Nothing happened when they took Mosul. Nothing happened when they took to Crit. And then they said, oop, we got a problem. Right? I don't know. I, I think that is, is really an unfair assessment of what we knew and how we watched it develop. Uh, they clearly stated their intentions. We knew what their intentions were. Uh, they clearly were arming and training. We saw that. Uh, so it, you know, maybe they didn't say they're crossing the berm on this day, but boy, it would be hard press if you didn't pay attention to this intelligence to come to the conclusion something bad has happened in here. So your complaint isn't with intelligence, it's with how the administration responded to the intelligence. Or didn't, you know, not responding is a decision. Not making a decision is a decision. And Again, I have been pretty vocal in the last two years about trying to bring this problem to the attention of the public on why we needed to do something in Syria because uh, of the potential. Now, did we know they were going into Iraq? Mm, I'm not sure, but they clearly want, they want Lebanon, they want Jordan, they want Israel, they want all of Syria, and they do want Iraq. And so it was very clear they were going to try to expand their interests from eastern Syria, and it was, which was a safe haven for two and a half years. Jeff? Mr. Chairman, a couple senators said yesterday after the closed-door briefing, the classified briefing, that the threat, has, the threat to the homeland is more urgent than it seemed last week. And it, uh, one senator said that if you, anyone who walked out of the briefing could not uh, quibble with the fact that there is an urgent and dire threat to the homeland here. Do you agree with that? And how urgent is that threat? Uh, I, I do. And now remember how we come to this conclusion. So we knew, remember the fight a year and a half ago was, do we do external operations against the United States and Europe or not? So I hear he said, focus on Iraq. Right? So the very fact that they're having the discussion sends a chill down my spine. That means somebody is in an operational status trying to put together something that would look like something that could get the green light, including access to people who had Western passports. Right? I mean, that's the most dangerous thing. You fly to Germany and you're a German citizen, you're flying to the United States, you don't need a visa. Right? That's a problem. That's a big problem for us or fill in any other country in the EU or vice versa. And so what we've seen now is they're, six, you know, they're a little bit drunk on their own success. And they understand, matter of fact, an interesting, I, saw, I read an interesting report recently uh, that, that uh, um, Baghdadi was talking about the fact that Zawahiri, if he were to come to Syria or Iraq, would have to pay deference to him, to, to Baghdadi, because he is the only one establishing a land-based caliphate. Now you think of that mentality. That's a scary mentality. Now, they both want the same exact thing. They both want... Uh, to attack the United States. They're going to go about it in maybe different ways. With access to these Western passports and their stated intention, 
to commit acts of terror beyond their areas of operation. That is why I, I'm, I wasn't in the Senate briefing, but I imagine that's what those senators walked out thinking, th this is pretty bad. And they have complete safe haven. There's nothing to disrupt their activity. They can plan it, finance it, train for it. The training camps have been unabetted for years. They just let it go. That's how you get to this place where you wonder, uh, you know, we're in some trouble. And of course, the most recent court ruling that says you, that we don't, you can't have a no-fly list, uh, perfect. That's a great recipe for disaster. I don't know if there was a federal ruling, I think, yesterday on that. In Oregon. Yeah. Was it Oregon? It was Oregon. It was the uh, federal district court for the District of Oregon. We might as well get you to say a little more about it. Um, <laughs> said that putting, you know, the procedures for putting someone on the no-fly list were inadequate, violated the Fifth Amendment right to due process, called on Homeland Security Department to provide more information to people about why they're on the list and also ways for getting off the list. So you would disagree with that? Uh, uh, <clears throat> so we have, uh, according to public reports, an organization trying to build bombs that circumvent security. They're working with another organization, according to public reports, uh, that uh, in Syria, that have expressed an interest in trying to show their chops by having a, an international terrorist attack. Uh, and now you just had a judge rule that you can't put someone on a no-fly list. Uh, you tell me why I can't sleep at night. Right? That makes no sense whatsoever. And by the way, the international community has no-fly lists. That means you'll just be able to fly domestically. Congratulations. That is about the worst of all world. I, that, that makes no sense to me whatsoever. If they want to refine them, maybe they can do that. And they ought to look at refining them fairly quickly. I hope the case is appealed and the decision is stayed only for the purposes of making sure we have the opportunity to, if you have a, a pretty good idea that somebody has an ill intention on that aircraft, that you can keep them off the aircraft. We're going to go next to uh, Maureen, uh, then uh, to uh, Ken, and then to John Gizzi. Maureen? Um, back to the comment about the coalition within the Republican Party and the debate going on about mm -hmm. which group has more seats. Do you see when you um, leave Congress and you're, in your, you're doing your radio show, is one of your um, the things you're trying to accomplish in that show is to try to push the party in a particular direction to get one of those groups to be more successful than the other? And if so, which one? And uh, my goal uh, has always been to, is, is a productive conservative, which means you actually accomplish something. So when coalitions are tearing themselves apart, it's really hard to form a governing majority. Uh, I look back at some of the fights that have happened within the Republican conference and how much money we let get spent because we couldn't agree on the exact amount. So rather than get uh, half of what you wanted, the, because of the way the, the conference was fighting amongst itself, we got zero, right? So we couldn't agree that there were 42 job training programs needed to be 26. People said 26 is too many. So you know how many we ended up with? Like whatever it was, 42. That, that is not productive governing conservatism, conservatism in my mind. So I, you know, I think there's just a, a way we can focus our efforts to get the government to look a lot more the way I think most conservatives want it to look, which is lean and mean, you know, not mean in, the, in that term, but lean in the sense that it's functioning, that we're not wasting money, that it takes care of people who need it, uh, but doesn't do things the government, federal government shouldn't be doing. And I, you know, if, if we're together as a force, I think there's a lot of that we could have accomplished in the last two years that we just left on the table. Uh, and that's to me is uh, unfortunate. We fight about some of the things in my mind um, that are small potatoes if we could come to an agreement on bigger, broader, uh, limited government issues that we just couldn't quite get consensus on uh, f for this notion that we're going to have a perfect score, right? You have to have a perfect score. Uh, I don't know anywhere in life that that works, including the U.S. government. Ken? Um, I think you just alluded to this, but can you say a little more about the intelligence that suggests that a UAP bomb-making expertise from Yemen has migrated to Syria? and that they're working on perfecting bombs that can get past security. That seems to be driving the threat that Jeff is asking about. Um, how, how serious a threat is that? Has, have they perfected a bomb that can get past that's better than the underwear bomb? And, and, and are AQAP people in Syria right now? Well, if you look at the, I mean, I can't confirm any specific uh, reports, but, but I mean, if, here's what we can look at that's in the public domain. And, and I think it's fair to draw a conclusion from what's in the public domain. You have 
AQAP, who has designed the ink cartridge bombs, remember those, that were, they were going to detonate, I forget how many now, say 8 or 11 or whatever it was, 9, uh, in different <coughs> airplanes over, over the oceans, right? That was their goal. And these cartridges were designed to circumvent security. You know, some good intelligence work, able, we're able to shut that particular operation down. But we know that they never stopped trying to design um, explosives that circumvent security. So the underwear bomber was a great example. That was n another iteration on December 25th uh, that, they, uh, uh, that they thought that they could get through security and, and set off on an airplane. And candidly, but for a quarter of an inch of a syringe pull, uh, that plane would have blown up and we would have killed thousands of people in their homes. It's a, it flies over a very populated area of Detroit into its <coughs> landing zone. So you'd have had all that equipment falling through the houses while people were sleeping in their beds, right? This, this was not just the airplane itself, which would have been horrific, but the ground damage would have been significant. So uh, that was their second iteration. Well, we know that they haven't given up on the notion that they're going to develop something that circumvents security and gets on an airplane. That's just the fact of the matter. So now you see those things, and you see this relationship that started very early in 2013. And some of it, by the way, was to mediate. There was, you know, in the beginning, before this decision came down to decertify uh, ISIL as an Al-Qaeda affiliate, they tried to mend their fences. Matter of fact, all of the Al-Qaeda leadership was saying, you need to fix this, right? They don't want to lose these very aggressive fighters who shoot people in the head, right? That's a value to them. Uh, scares us, that's a, that's a badge of honor for them. They wanted to keep those folks in the fold. Couldn't work out. Uh, so now you have El Nusra, who also has expressed an interest in creating, uh, you know, this, that's the other group in eastern Syria, uh, that, that is an Al-Qaeda affiliate, that has expressed an interest in external operations. And you know that there's a relationship between AQAP and El Nusra, uh, in, including what we think intermediaries and the like. That in and of itself, I think, would allow any logical person to come to the conclusion, we have a problem, right? Uh, we have a definite problem that there, and then we know that Al Qaeda in the past shares technical expertise on IEDs, uh, how to circumvent security, uh, uh, surveillance, uh, and all the things that come with those conversations of how not to be a target of the U.S. or our allies. We know that all shares. You can only you can draw your own conclusion with that that bit of information. Um, and I'll tell you, I, this this is worrying me a lot. On that. I, mean, isn't, I understand, you know, sources and methods, but this is a basic sort of fact, if it's a fact, that like, a QAP is... Well, it's obtained by, you know, sources and methods and how information, certain information is obtained and how we want to protect the ability to continue to, to find out information that may, in fact, stop an event. Um, to me, would be very, very important to protect those ways so that uh, if there is a threat information, and, and by the way, uh, if you remember the leak that happened with the bomber, that remember the, the AQAP bombing thing, there was a pretty significant leak on about the bomb. We saw real changes in real time that, about that leak that really did disrupt U.S. and our allies' ability to collect information on AQAP. It cost us a long time. Uh, matter of fact, some of it we may never get back. And so those things are, it was just the procedure about who, what, when, and how got leaked, and it changed the way they operated to, to the point where we lost our ability to see some things. That's dangerous, and I just think we ought to try to protect it so that we have the ability uh, to catch somebody that, if they're going to get on a plane or not, or hopefully you catch them a lot earlier. And if, by the time, if we have to catch them getting on a plane, there has been a failure in the system. Right? Sure. Well, just a sec. Go, go ahead. But normally people ask me call on. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so there's no clear line yet between um, ISIS and AQAP. Is it? Is this just sort of? We can speculate that they may work together. Is there? A clear well, we line? know that they have. They've. Ha they all have relationships. They have had inter intermediary uh, exchanges. We know that. Uh, remember, once they were decertified, they became. They decided they were going to go their own direction. Um, again, their goals and intentions are exactly the same. There isn't a, uh, a fraction of a difference. The tactics of how they get there may have been different. And Zawahiri's position with them was, if I can't control you, 
I'm not going to have you as part of our group. And he did that primarily because being part of AQ gets you financing, it gets you status, it gets you recruits. Uh, what I think he underestimated is uh, that these folks were winning on the battlefield. Uh, and when you're winning on the battlefield, that in and of itself attracts other jihadists because they want to be a part of the winning team, if you will. And so they're, they're the same, they're exactly the same. They still have this uh, kind of funny respect for each other. Again, I'd look at it as two organized crime families, right? When they have a difference, they'll fight you. Uh, but when there's mutual benefit, they'll be together. And it's really the same kind of thing. They're, they are Al-Qaeda minded, no different. They want to establish the caliphate. They'll use all the tools of political violence to, to do it. Uh, a couple of mechanical things. Uh, we're about halfway through. We're going to go next to John Gizzi, Paul Bedard, and Guy Taylor. Anybody who came in late and wants a question, wave your hand at me. Mr. Gizzi. Mm. Thank you, Dave. Mr. Chairman. Sir. Um, take picking up on your analogy of the organized crime family. It has been said that some of America's friends in the Middle East that we depend on, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, are akin to merchants in the city paying protection money to Don Vito Corleone when it comes to um, ISIL or some of the other terrorist groups. Uh, do you have any solid evidence that Qatar, Saudi Arabia are indeed uh, also paying ISIL or other terrorist groups and what can be done about it? Because when they talk about a winning coalition, your colleagues on Capitol Hill inevitably talk about those countries, not Iran. Well, I think we, and, and again, this is a, a, a product of indecision uh, in a very difficult neighborhood. Right? So when you see a problem in the Middle East, you have to deal with it. End of story. Uh, deciding that we're not going to deal with it as some notion of uh, a foreign policy uh, framework, this is what you get. So let me, let me talk to you through that. Early on in Syria, our Arab League partners came to us and said, we want the United States not, to, this is not about boots on the ground, it's not about big military, but we need your help. We need your help with some command and control. We want you helping guide any support, think of this, any support that the Arab League is producing so that we do this in a way that is vetted properly uh, and doesn't come back to bite us. Wow, very reasonable offer. And the United States response was, nope, not, that's too hard. We're not going to do it. And so what happened was uh, other parts of that Arab League started to fracture, right, which is why you needed the United States showing the leadership role at the table. That would have been a very, very important role for us to play. Um, and so we know for a fact that some of the supplies that some of those Arab League uh, countries were su supplying were getting in the hands of extremists. Uh, and it also caused, because of the, the way that was ramped up, even our Arab League partners started fighting amongst themselves or disagreeing amongst themselves because they realized that one country was more aggressive than the other country and some of those materials were ending up in a place uh, that was bad for the, even their own national security interests. And so that's how this problem got started. Uh, and the United States never quite weighed in. I have had significant appeals from our Arab League partners to me personally. I know other members have as well about their frustration with the lack of United States engagement and leadership on these issues. Uh, and because of it, we watched that, that a lot of that money and, and, and weapons did migrate its way to the most violent extremists operating in eastern Syria. Uh, and that empowered the very problem that we have today. Um, and as frustrating as that is, I still think there's an opportunity to re-engage. Uh, and candidly, having the Secretary of State just show up for a chat uh, isn't going to do it. Right? They need to see something. Um, and as one Arab League uh, leader told me uh, about two years ago, uh, if, if you are not going to sit at the table with us, you don't get to lecture us as what that table looks like. Right? And that's what you saw happening and unfolding. And now that nobody, you know, we didn't make big news at the time, uh, but that was really the gas that got thrown on the fire to allow ISIS to start to develop because they had access to all this really good equipment. Uh, and again, 
certain of those Arab League countries didn't really mind if it went to extremists. They figured they could deal with that later, is what they told us. Uh, but having the U.S. not sitting at the table was a huge problem. What was the, the timetable on this? Well, we've known about this for, what, three years? Mm -hmm. So the discussions happened the first course of those 12 months. Um, and every month over end, the, the, our opportunity to impact this got worse and worse, right? So the options you had at three years were, weren't the options you had at 24 months, weren't the options you had at 18 months ago. I mean, it completely deteriorated before our eyes, and we watched all of this happen, which was, I think, highly unfortunate. Which, to me, again, this is why engagement's important in the world. Right? This fight we have now about isolationism versus engagement, this is why engagement is so important. Paul? Chairman, can you look down to our southern border and, and what, what do you see there as a, a, th a threat to the United States? The story for the past couple of weeks has been about 70,000 unaccompanied kids coming across the border. But is there something else there that, that might worry you? Well, I can tell you the first trip I took as chairman of the committee was to Mexico. Why? We had the real opportunity for failed northern provinces in Mexico, failed governing states. Uh, that is a huge national security risk to the United States. So these organized criminal elements down there were controlling huge swaths of land. Um, the fighting you saw was because there was lack of police authority and the bad guys were winning and they were policing themselves. They had these rival gang fights and all of that, the beheadings and the laying the bodies on the roadways. That was telling you we were well on our way to something pretty awful happening. Uh, and even with the 70,000 uh, you know, kids, uh, they're not you know, getting in VW vans and driving up on a nice country drive to get up through uh, Central America and through Mexico into the United States. These are controlled by criminal elements. Uh, and what outrages me is that there is no compassion in allowing these criminal elements, because I'll guarantee you there is slave trade uh, issues going on, exposure to drugs. You've already heard the reports about they're trying to figure out which ones can be recruited into gangs before they get up here. This is pretty, pretty awful stuff. Um, and so I do worry about that failed, those failed northern states. We have done some good things with Mexico. It's, I think in some ways it's getting a little better. Um, they have been very leery about having uh, direct U.S. support, but we know some of our uh, other success stories around uh, Central and South America, Colombia being a great example, uh, is now in a position where they might be able to help Mexico train their counterterrorism forces, train their uh, uh, counter narcotics forces that I think could be impactful. But it's been a long, slow road. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, you know, you get on the south side of those, that Mexican border, it is as lawless as it gets. Uh, and those, if that truly devolves into failed states, we're going to have a significant security threat from our southern border. Uh, Guy? Uh, thanks for being here, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think it's pretty, uh, it's certainly interesting we're having this public conversation now about what ISIL actually is and what its relationship to the other affiliates uh, uh, happens to be. What I'm interested in is what you've seen in terms of uh, this recent surge by the group and its alliances with Sunni groups uh, in, in Iraq that aren't necessarily aligned with this idea of creating an Islamist caliphate might actually be, be uh, partners in, in the administration's push for an inclusion government in, in Baghdad. Uh, what is the nexus between these two groups? How, how, how reliant on moderate Sunnis has ISL become in Iraq? One, and then two is uh, you know, what specifically should we be doing? I mean, you're in a unique position as, as a senior member of the oversight community of the IC, and, and we all are hearing people say the administration did this wrong, the administration, what actually could we be doing differently in sending sure. 300 fusion cell troops, and what should we do right now? Uh, and we have a good history on why are the Sunni tribes joining um, ISIL in their march toward Baghdad. And if you look at what happened in, in the establishment of the Taliban in Afghanistan, so because of the outer regions, and they had some different differences uh, with the leadership in Kabul, that 
there were you know, horrible corruption, horrible uh, injustices being done to the tribes that weren't in power. And the Taliban came in, actually Mullah Omar, uh, got his start uh, because there was some allegation of a rape of, a, I think, a 14-year-old girl. Um, and no justice was done. Mullah Omar came in and meted justice on the spot. Dragged somebody out in the street and hung him, I think. I think he hung him. Um, and it started this swell of, hey, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Right? What the other government was doing wasn't so good. Well, what they found once the Taliban took over is that this is pretty awful, right? Looked pretty good at the time. Turns out it's pretty awful. Stoning of women, made it illegal to teach little girls how to read. Uh, you know, pretty brutal stuff. Can't leave your house without, uh, if you're a woman, without a male escort, even if that male escort is six years old. I mean, it's really kind of crazy stuff, right? So then that's when all the chafing started in, in, in Afghanistan. We saw the same thing in Libya to a lesser degree. Uh, people joined together because they were against Muammar Gaddafi. And once it was done, they said, hey, wait a minute, this more radical Sharia law implementation, not for me, right? So that's what you see brewing in Libya. It is exactly the same thing happening in Iraq. The Sunni tribal leaders are pushing back against what they view uh, as an unjust, unfair, corrupt um, Shia-led government by Maliki, uh, and they're not going to put up with it. What they're finding now, when they take over a city like Mosul and they're implying, applying Sharia law, that chafing is already starting. Right? They're not, because it takes away those Sunni tribe leadership, right? now they're no longer quite in charge. Uh, the mullahs are, lose a little influence in that kind of an arrangement. So we're seeing that happening. That's the same thing that was tapped into in 06, for the awakening that it separated the Sunni tribes from uh, Zarqawi and Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And so you're gonna see this come together and you're gonna see the fraying already begin and we're seeing some of that. So uh, I argue that you cannot allow ISIL to continue to have success the way it is. There has to be a disruptive activity. That means maybe training camps. That means you have to directly target command and control and leadership in a way that's disruptive. And one of the things about airstrikes or not airstrikes, uh, it, that's a tactic. We, don't, we ought not to be having, the president shouldn't be debating over a tactic and neither should we. We should be talking about a strategy. Airstrikes may be a part of that, it may not be a part of that. A special forces raid may be a part of that, it may not be a part of that. We have to have a strategy that goes after uh, ISIL leadership and, and its logistics trains, by the way, which starts in Syria. You really can't be effective if you don't take away their safe haven in eastern Syria. Uh, the reason they, they're controlling those border points is they know that that's the way they're going to continue to resupply their efforts all across Iraq and vice versa. If they ever decide to turn that around and head toward Lebanon, they're going to need that, they're gonna need that uh, supply line both ways. We have, the United States has unique capabilities, and I'm not talking about troops on the ground. Um, when I say troops on the ground, big troops on the ground. Uh, 101st Airborne, the 4th Infantry Division, holding ground, you know, the first uh, Marine um, MEF. Uh, that's not what we're talking about, but we're talking about uh, a st strategic disruption of ISIL. That will give breathing room for political reconciliation to happen in Baghdad. I don't think you'll ever get political reconciliation until you get some breathing room. Uh, we'll, we don't have leverage the way we're operating currently. Um, and even the very thought that we were going to have a conversation with Iran about this solution, you can imagine all the calls that we get from our Arab League partners about what a god-awful idea that is, right? Some of these things, they need to stop talking at that level and start applying a strategic solution to this so that we can show some disruption, stop their momentum, hurt their command and control, hurt their logistics base, so make them have to uh, reconsider what aggressive uh, offensive operations that they take. You go to the gentleman in the green tie. I'm blanking on the name. I apologize. Then to Catherine and then to Francine. I <laughs> Sorry. And now further known as the gentleman with the green tie. <laughs> I don't, I never, These senior moments are terrible, let me tell you. And I, I think I've not worn the screen tie in two years. Right. Uh, you, legislative priorities for you before you uh, depart? You have a few things on the plate. I mean, you just got the intelligence authorization bill. I didn't know what you were looking at before you. Yeah, we want to finish up. Uh, uh, the FISA legislation to make sure that uh, we can get our uh, 
uh, the NSA and others focused on all of the threats versus looking over their shoulder uh, uh, at, uh, at what is a tidal wave of misinformation about what they do. Um, that's going to be important to, to get that so that Americans kind of re-engage re in the confidence that their intelligence services are there to keep them safe, which, by the way, they are. Uh, that's important. The, we just got the 2014 bill done yesterday. Why that's important, uh, the authorization bill, excuse me, is because there's lots of reforms in there. Some of those reforms are based on uh, making sure our security clearance operations are changed a little bit so that we're more accurate at catching somebody who may be going bad and, say, stealing a whole bunch of stuff and running to places like, I don't know, Moscow. Um, the 2015 budget also makes some important investments, which we're gonna, we have to get done, uh, in uh, continue our dominance in space. Uh, we're at the back end of that arrangement. We better pick up our pace, so we're going to be in trouble. Uh, making sure we're making the right investment in our ability to protect ourselves from what is a growing uh, list of countries and non-nation states uh, cyber capabilities, which is very, very, again, very, very concerning. We're on the back end of that one. We've got to pick up our pace uh, and continue our investment in human uh, collection uh, throughout the year. And lastly, uh, this week we had a, a great round of negotiations in the last few weeks with the Senate on an information sharing bill. And so um, Saxby Chambliss and Diane Feinstein are going to vote out a cyber sharing bill this week, I think thurs Thursday? I think, that's, I think that's the day, Thursday. Uh, this is going to be critically important. If we are ever going to stay in front of this problem, this won't solve all our problems, but if we're ever going to stay in front of what is a growing threat matrix just on cyber disruptive attacks, we have got to have this bill in place so that the private sector can protect itself. Um, and right now, any offensive action we would take, indicting five Chinese intelligence officials who we know are stealing our stuff, uh, it exposes the 85% of networks that are private sector networks that won't have the ability to withstand nation state style attacks, both from an espionage perspective or a disruption perspective. So those are my immediate priorities. And then the continue uh, the internal policy debates on we have on things like covert action and other things that I think we need to get right uh, with the community. And I hope to do that before I leave in January. Catherine. For doing this, yeah. um, for, hi, good. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, for a layperson, how would you characterize this relationship between ISIL and AQAP? The skills that they're sharing, and is it this relationship that is driving public statements from others on the Hill that it's a direct threat to the U.S. homeland? Secondly, were there consistent, multiple strategic warnings from the IC about ISIL, and if so, who failed to act on them? Well. Again, I'll start with the last part first. It, it, I argue this is a result of an indecision, which I argue indecision, which is a policy failure. This is not an intelligence failure. It's a policy failure. Uh, and it's pretty easy to blame the guys who are out standing in the dust trying to collect the right pieces of information. Again, I'll, I'll say it one more time because I think this is important. We watch them pool up. We watch the debate between El Nusra and ISIL. We watch the concern between the Al Qaeda leadership, Zawahiri, about trying to get them back in the fold. We watch training camps get built and developed. We watch them get weapons. We watch them get finances. We watched uh, Western passport holders show up at these camps. We watched it all. Uh, we heard their stated intentions. Now, the reason they're called the Islamic uh, State in Iraq and the Levant is because they want the Levant, which is Lebanon and Syria and Jordan. Uh, they want it all. And they've decided they're gonna, they became strong enough to actually implement it. And again, the reason they're a small number of folks is having a big success in places around Iraq uh, is the other policy failure of we're just packing up and going home. We don't care if the, all the troops are ready or not. We're just coming home because this is hard. Uh, and I think that was a major disaster. If you'd had a U.S. presence, and I'm not talking about engaged in combat operations in Iraq every day, but if you'd had a U.S. presence there, uh, it would have allowed the security services to, to be more uh, sustainable. It would have influenced the political fracturing we saw happen after we left. That's the whole purpose of that, so that you get better reconciliation. Uh, and you could have seen 
uh, up close and personal the trouble that was being developed in Syria, because Syria was going to have this problem at some point. Uh, what we didn't understand uh, early on was that ISIL was going to take such advantage of it. So those are all policy failures in my mind that has led to this. You can't blame the intelligence community. You can't blame Congress. This is an, a foreign policy failure of a magnitude that will risk the security of the United States of America. So they need to shake themselves out of that and start coming up with a strategy to win this fight. So, so where does the buck stop on that? Does it stop with the president? Does it stop with the national security advisor? I mean, who, who failed to act here? Well, I mean, ultimately, it's the president of the United States. This is his policy of, uh, I forget what he calls it, don't do stupid something. What was it? No, <laughs> okay. I wasn't going to jump in there. <laughs> Would you speak in the microphone? <laughs> what was that? Uh, if, if that... And that it's almost laughable that that is even the mindset of a national security team that threats, you know, they see the same threats we see. It's not like they didn't get the same stuff that we got. Uh, and some notion that if we just don't do anything really hard, that everything will be just fine is absolutely, I think it's a bit naive. Uh, it's a bit uh, politically uh, self-serving. Uh, that you're more concerned about what, uh, what ratings you have at home than what threats happen overseas. That's a danger, that is a really dangerous mindset. Uh, and, I, and at some point they just keep doubling down on this notion that, well, this is, now it's hard, so let's stay out of it. Okay, I get that. The problem is they are threatening the United States of America. That's the problem. Does it give you any pause? Does it make you want to stay? Do you, do you regret your decision? You know, uh, I've been in public service now with the FBI and the Army and the legislature for 28 years. That's a long time. Um, this is an opportunity to talk to people, hopefully, in a way that I don't get the chance to talk to them now. You know, you, uh, I'm pigeonholed in that, uh, and I love it, don't get me wrong, the intelligence space, I think it's important work. But I think most Americans don't get to hear the other side of this conversation of why, if we had been engaged early, we may have avoided this problem. Right? That, I don't ever hear that conversation. Certainly in talk radio, I don't hear that conversation. Um, and so I think this is just an opportunity for me to talk to a lot more people about why it's important, uh, why American exceptionalism does matter. Certainly our Arab League partners have been crying for it for five years. Uh, and to have a dialogue in a different way that hopefully influenced the debate. So by 2016, we have a whole bunch of Americans who are tr truly interested in, in national security, international engagement, economic prosperity for the next generation that I just don't hear. You, so you, in you, that regard, I'm looking forward to that challenge. As a, as a and journalist, Campbell's soup, and drink it, it's right. mm -mm good. Right? As, a, as a journalist, the idea of having access to all that information with sort of like a kid in a candy store, you know what? Do you, are you feel, starting to feel a period of withdrawal in terms of knowing so much? You know, the, the problem was once I announced, things seemed to get worse, right? So, uh, and in that regard, I, I, without the campaign looming over my head, I've spent a lot more time down there yeah. trying to go through all this and, and formulate hopefully policy and advice. And, you know, I've had my conversations, by the way, with the White House and expressed my concerns. And, you know, I'm not telling a tale out of school. We've had our uh, disagreements. We've had our agreements, by the way. Um, and I think it was right that the president made the decision to send 300 advisors in, with the right mix of individuals that he did. Good on you. Now we have a lot more to do. But I, you know what? I, I, there comes a time, and I think you know it. Um, and if I can influ influence by talking to a lot more people about the importance of these issues in a way they might not hear today, then I think maybe I can do something more positive in that regard. Nick, will you? I'm, oh, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. We got lost in that excellent answer we had. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, how would you characterize the relationship between AQAP and ISIL for a layperson to the extent that they're sharing best practices, people, skills? And is it this relationship that is driving the public statements from your colleagues on the Hill that it's now a direct threat to the U.S. homeland? Well, uh, two things. So AQAP has a stronger relationship with El Nusra Front. Uh, that is, a, I believe, a direct uh, and ongoing relationship that has uh, command and control and advice and counsel roles attached to it. ISIL is now a, exactly the same mindset, but it has a bit of a competitive nature to AQAP, excuse, not AQAP, but to Al-Qaeda in general. So their goal is to establish the caliphate now. Zawahiri wanted to wait. Uh, 
they decided that they wanted it now. And so again, they're, I think they are a little bit, as I said earlier, drunk on their success uh, and really do believe that this is their time to outshine them. Same exact wants, desires, techniques, tactics. They want the caliphate. And they also are willing to conduct operations outside their operations area. And uh, I'm not sure you're here for that, but Zawahiri, uh, this whole debate that they were brutal and that's why Zawahiri cut them free is, is nonsense. It was all about ISIL wanting to do external operations based on the large number of Western passport holders. And Zawahiri didn't want to do that yet. He wanted them to focus on Iraq, go back and fight Iraq, have Al Nusra fight in Syria, and then they would make the determination of what external targets to hit. That's what the started the split. So again, they all know each other. There's a little bit of, I'll, sh I'll show them kind of an attitude. Um, Today, I would, I would describe it as a competitive relationship. Or an ISIL. Yes, but same goals, same intentions. They even have this mutual respect going back and forth, right? Remember, they were an Al-Qaeda affiliate. This is just a disagreement on the tactics of what the, how they want to succeed. That's really what this is. Did you not say earlier that there was a relationship, at least at a level of intermediaries, between AQAP and ISIL, or did I misunderstand that? That was, they were, they had intermediaries established trying to work out the differences before uh, they were separated from AQ, uh, AQ uh, leadership. Anybody who hasn't had one, you wave at me, Nick, go ahead. Getting back to you, um, thinking about leaving, um, with uh, Representative Camp announcing his retirement and some of your other colleagues, do you worry at all about your home state of Michigan losing any of its influence or power in, the, in Congress? You know, I, um, you know, obviously you don't want us all to go at the same time, but with the term limits, this is going to happen to other states. Other states are going to get a rise in chairman from one state and then they're going to leave. Uh, so this is, this is bound to happen. Uh, you know, Fred Upton is going to be there. He's certainly a, a, a powerful chairman and, and a, a great advocate for our state. I think that'll help the newer folks who get elected come in uh, and get established and, and allow to have an impact for the state of Michigan. So, you know, obviously the timing isn't great, but again, it's all based on this time frame of how long can you be a chairman. Uh, and it was just an odd coincidence, candidly, that we got four chairmen, which is unusual, especially for a state like Michigan. Um, and it was, as I told my people back home, good while it lasted. Um, but, you know, this, this, the other ones will come up. And I'm a, I'm a huge believer that, this, that people shouldn't be here for 50 years. Um, it, I think it's better when you get a little bit of a churn. You get new ideas. It's a, it's a, it should be a representational body. Uh, I think this is a good thing that people come in and come out. Last question, um, Francine. Oh, no, go ahead. Kind of wonky, sorry about that. No worries. Uh, yesterday, I like wonky, that's my problem. <laughs> uh, on the governance issue in Congress, yesterday the Bipartisan uh, Policy Center uh, released a whole set of recommendations on how Congress and the election system and so on could become more governable. One of the things they said was power back to the committees and uh, marrying up the House schedule and the Senate schedule, working five days a week, that kind of thing. What's your thought about appetite for that within the Congress? Ooh, um, I'm not, you know, I'm gonna just, just, first of all, dispose of this issue that members of Congress don't work five days a week and I'm leaving so I can say anything I want. If they work less than six days a week, I don't know that member of Congress. Uh, that is a complete misnomer. The problem we've gotten ourselves into in Congress uh, is that we get yanked around by these uh, sometimes populist trends at home that don't translate into the information we know as members of Congress and the lack of willingness to have that discussion back home. That's a huge problem. Uh, and a leadership that is geared toward the smallest minority in any coalition is always dangerous. And so you have this, uh, you know, notion that um, that it's better to be at home sometimes than working on these issues through a committee process. I believe in the committee process in Congress. I think it's the best way to get uh, a bill that will have the 
uh, best opportunity and challenge to bring people together. You have to actually sit down and work through some really hard differences. And it doesn't mean you sacrifice who you are or your principles. Uh, it just means you get to a place that people can support uh, something moving forward. And I like to think our committee has been able to do that in the Intelligence Committee. Uh, you know, we've passed six, we're going to get all, but every budget since, since I've been chairman and Dutch Ruppersberger has been ranking member. That's unusual, uh, but an important thing to have happen in a committee like ours. So it can happen. Uh, it should happen. Uh, and we ought to, the questions at home shouldn't be, what are you doing to fill in the blank on this other major issue? It should be, well, on your committee, what are you doing on this particular problem? How are you going to make that problem better? If every member is a generalist, uh, we're going to be in trouble, right? So I spent my last four years not being a generalist. I've looked at all the issues of national security, and I think it helps. I think members who serve on ag and serve on energy and commerce and serve on those committees, what we should demand of them is more time in committee working through these issues, right? And if that means staying in D.C. five days a week, okay, so be it. I think you can do it in less, but you have to force people to show up and do their work in committee. That's a hard thing to do. And we've gotten away from that. And I think that has caused huge problems in the ability to build coalitions to move things forward. Um, I, I, tune in next month, uh, you. or in, uh, in six months, and I'll, I'll lay out the whole thing for yeah. you. <laughs> thanks for doing this, sir. Thanks for having me. Thanks I appreciate to Kelsey it. Kelsey for helping us set it up. Yeah, appreciate thanks. it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, sir.